Thank you so much for joining us on um, this wonderful Thursday. Uh, my name is Raul Carvajal. I'm from Games for Change. I'm the production manager and also uh, lead strategy for XR for Change. Um, thank you so much for joining our talk and play today. It's our first talk and play of the year. And I'm really excited to be bringing y'all our um, guests, uh, the Stevenson Brewster family. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. And before I get into it, um, just want to speak a little bit about our program and um, maybe for anybody that's new to XR for Change. Uh, XR for Change is a, an initiative that we launched a couple of years ago that is really reliant and uh, reliant in elevating the conversation around immersive experiences uh, that are being focused for social impact. So that includes education, healthcare, and even raising awareness around civic and social issues. So um, we put together these uh, talk and play series in pre-COVID times. So we would be in a room together. You'd be able to interact with these folks, do some networking, and also try some of the games. Um, so that, that would be the play bit. But today, we're really excited that we can make this a relatively more accessible uh, virtual format for you so you can hear from our awesome guests. Um, with that, I'll, I'll jump right into it. Uh, the name of our event today is Black Visions, Black, Black Voices, uh, Fostering Equity Through Immersive Storytelling. And we've got Michelle Stevenson, Joe Brewster, and Idris Brewster, a family of creators. Uh, and uh, I'm going to let them jump in and introduce themselves. Why don't we start with you, Idris? Hi, everyone. Um, first off, Raul, thanks for having me. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak uh, about my work. And so my name is Idris. I'm an artist, I'm an educator, and I'm a creative technologist. And the piece that I'm mainly going to be talking about today is called Traveling Interstition with Octavia Butler. And it was a piece that I worked on with five other artists over this past year. And we kind of, kind of went through a little bit of a period where we read a lot of Octavia Butler's work and soaked in a lot of her genius. And through that process kind of translated what we were feeling into six different XR and web XR environments. And so that is that project was aligned with a lot of my work, which is really focusing on using this uh, medium of XR as a device to push the narrative forward on social impact, especially in regards to black and brown communities. So thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, we'll push it over to Michelle. Oh, Michelle, you're muted. I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Michelle Stevenson. I am uh, a storyteller, filmmaker based in uh, Brooklyn, New York, also now an XR maker. Uh, I've been uh, delving into the field. I'm also Idris's mother. <laughs> And uh, I, I am the partner of Joe Brewster, and we uh, we like to call ourselves sort of platform agnostic. So we are storytellers at the core. Um, Joe likes to tell we're sort of this modern day griot, and he can speak a little bit more to that in terms of the importance of storytelling in, in community and for personal also healing and transformation. And so um, we collaborated on a project called The Changing Same uh, VR, which premiered at Sundance, the first episode called The Dilemma. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and you get a chance to see the trailer for it. But um, uh, uh, personally, I'm originally from the Caribbean, born in Haiti uh, to a Haitian mother, a father and a Panamanian mother um, and uh, grew up here in North America, uh, New York and Canada. So, Joe? Um, good evening. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be here. My name is uh, Joe uh, Brewster. Look, I, you look like a little bit of both of us, Idris. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and we're honored to be here on stage with our son. Like, this is like almost the first, right? Yeah. Uh, I am a, a maker. I'm, uh, I come to this as a um, a kid who grew up in Los Angeles who was very angry that uh, I didn't see black folks in Hollywood. <laughs> I like, I, I, what I did is uh, my father uh, cleaned garages for, for folks in Hollywood. But, but in, in reality, uh, I decided that I wanted to make a, a difference 
And, um, and so over the years, uh, I decided to become a storyteller myself, tell my own stories. And, and what an amazing journey this has been. And, and, I, uh, and, and, and I, we've had an impact beyond anything I could have ever imagined at 12. I'm thanking Walt Disney for not uh, uh, making more films where the characters look like me. Awesome. Um, thank you all so much for that. So um, at the top, uh, I know that we're going to be diving into these two pieces in particular, but there's a lot of context that uh, I want to make sure folks understand, particularly with this relatively rare opportunity, right, to like understand uh, a family of makers, right, and, and what that dynamic has been like for you all, how it transcends into your work and really the impact that y'all are trying to achieve. So uh, we'll touch on all of that. Um, this is not just going to be a conversation amongst the four of us, I definitely encourage everybody watching um, to make sure that you comment and, and ask questions when you can. You can throw that in the chat, um, or if you would like to participate later on, we're going to have Q&A. So just make sure you raise your hand um, using the raise hand function in Zoom, and we'll be sure to call you. Um, I've got one person from my team, Noel Mazurik, who can also answer any tech questions. If you're having issues with the platform, hit her up, and uh, you can feel free to uh, get your answers. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll jump in. Um, I, I want to talk a bit about this uh, family dynamic, right? Uh, and particularly maybe some of the, the history that has brought us here um, with regard to Joe and Michelle, your work as, as filmmakers, and then Idris, now you, you've jumped in and, and started making your own stuff as well. Um, can you give the audience a, a bit of an understanding as to uh, where where you're pulling from in terms of the themes and stories that you're telling uh, a lot of the documentary work and some of the stuff that has come out and maybe uh, speak a little bit about American Promise, which I think kind of gives us a, a nice opportunity to talk about the family dynamic too. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I think I'll, I'll just uh, to summarize a little bit. I mean, uh, as Joe sort of mentioned earlier, I think our stories come from a very personal space, right? It's about uh, not just seeing us reflected, but uh, telling stories that kind of connect to us directly. And I think uh, in our earlier stages of the work, we actually went really deeply personal and we did a 13 year film with Idris as sort of the central protagonist where we turn the camera on our family and on him in particular and his educational journey uh, through a private elite school in Manhattan called the Dalton School. And the film really ended up focusing on black male achievement um, in the educational system. And we shot from kindergarten all the way to graduation from high school. And so we turned the camera on Idris and a friend of his, but also on the families and the school. And uh, it had a, you know, a really long tail in terms of its repercussive impact. Um, at first, it wasn't initially necessarily embraced by certainly the foundation community who had a certain vision of what they wanted to support and black middle class life was not part of that sort of, uh, it wasn't part of that, um, that uh, discourse or that uh, vision, but we were kind of very determined in our longitudinal approach that we would have something really special by the end and 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 we did so that was an extremely personal piece and i think everything else sort of resonates from that and uh our work is centered around um uh racial justice racial justice lens and um but we keep emotion and character and story at the center of that and so we were very much attracted to the vr experience and seeing what could we bring to that platform. I don't know if you want to expand on that in terms of American Promise and its impact. No, I want to go pre-American Promise. Uh -huh. I want to go back to medical school. Uh, and I, there was this guy at Harvard. His name is Dr. Funkenstein. And he was uh, a guy Notice I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> Ask me a question, I'm going to tell you a story. He was a guy who used to interview people. And he was known for nailing the shutdown, uh, the, sh the window down and having people freak out. And, and, and he would decide in a moment, you freaked out, you can't get in, right? So I was interviewed by Dr. Funkenstein at the urinal of my college. And, 
And he turned to me and he said, you know, what do you want to do? And I'm thinking, oh, shit, this is Dr. Funkenstein. So I can't freak out at this moment in the urinal. And I told him, uh, I wanted to end racism. Uh, and that's why I was coming to medical school. And he congratulated me for being accepted at the urinal <laughs> in Mem Hall at Stanford. And so I came to medical school. I really wanted to be a social psychiatrist. And I realized one-to-one -one work or group work was not significant. And so I left after my residency, came to New York uh, to study documentary filmmaking. And what did I do? I met, I met narrative filmmaking. I fell in love with narrative. I made two narrative films. My first one was at Sundance looking at the, uh, called The Keeper, starring John Carlo Esposito and uh, Regina Taylor and Isaac de Bancale. Uh, but what I learned along the way is a, a respect for uh, the emotional journey of characters, this, the respect for, for be beautiful pictures and story structure. But I, I really love learn the power of the story and the power of my story and, the, and the, the lack of fear of telling that story uh, uh, with the concern that other people, it won't resonate. Mm. And so what happened, and I'm, I'm going a long uh, uh, way around by saying that Michelle decided she wanted to be a documentary filmmaker and that I should take some time off while she learned that. <laughs> so uh, what, what I did is start shooting my son. Mm. And while she was making documentary, we were shooting and ultimately that became American Promise. Right. So uh, I, I think um, I'm interested in equity and justice and, and anti-blackness, but I, I think I can reduce that to the top power of telling uh, my story Mm -hmm. And I think I can reduce it to the power of each one of the people in this audience telling their story. Yeah, I think the, the motivation behind actually turning the camera on ourselves with the American Promise was really trying to balance, you know, uh, keeping up with the craft and learning the craft and paying the bills at the same time. So we were all kind of working multiple jobs as well as shooting this over the course of 13 years. Right. So Idris, I'm curious, right, like flipping it now, um, given that you had uh, such a, a central role in that piece, more as a, a subject, right? Um, there's the, the filmmaking aspect to it, but then of course you're like living your life, developing as a human, finding your identity, and eventually now coming to be a, a maker and a creator yourself, and in some ways, um, I won't say following footsteps necessarily, but you're, you're taking your own strides and, and making your own work. I wonder what the impact, say, of that piece specifically was on, on you and your creative process and maybe the ways that you've started to adapt uh, or speak to some of these same themes that your parents were touching on. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, it made me, first off, it made me a little bit more comfortable, I guess, in front of a camera, having uh, been, been having to do that naturally since I was like five years old. Um, it gave me the confidence to speak um, publicly, which is very helpful. Um, and throughout the process, I mean, it made me a little bit more introspective about what was going on in my life as me, but then also it really put a strong spotlight on the difference between what I was experiencing at home versus what I was experiencing in the school and outside. And so with that introspectiveness, what I, oh no, I'm um, sorry. With, 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 that, with that introspectiveness, what I saw was that what I was getting at home was a rich culture, a rich, um, a rich sense of creativity, a rich sense of telling your own story, but especially learning about my own story. Like the, my house is covered with Haitian art. My parents made sure that I always understood the lineage from where I came from and the history, especially um, yeah, just my history. And then when I was at school or when I was outside of the classroom, I wasn't getting that same exposure. 
um, is actually extremely lacking in those areas. And so as a creative, when it came time for me to tell my story and thinking about social impact, how I can actually make a change with telling my story, it lent me to kind of maybe use that to kind of fix the problems that I was seeing while growing up. And the introspection made it clear what those problems were. There was a lack of storytelling um, in a lot of institutional spaces around black and brown history, a lack of black and brown history in our public spaces. And it made me think about introspective about my present, but also the future and where we were going. And it made me also see that potentially black and brown stories were getting written out of what this future was. And when it came to even creating technology, the narrative between the technology space is really very white and not very inclusive of black and brown communities. Um, and so a lot of my work really goes within that lane of making space specifically, I guess right now in the digital and art and technology space for these stories to exist. And whether that is creating different stories like traveling the interstitial with Octavia Butler that has a space on the web that people can interact with um, black stories inspired by the black archive or whether it's one of my projects called Monuments app, uh, the Monuments project, which um, is building a foundation for these stories to be told within schools, within our public spaces um, that's really, I guess, the introspection and the problems that I noticed while I was growing up is really a lot of what's fueling this moving forward. And I think a lot of the introspection came from the conversations that were had in my house, outside of the camera, but also on camera. Like a lot of the, I was being asked introspective questions about race as a kindergartner. And even though I had no clue what was going on, I can tell looking back those interviews that I was still thinking about those things, even though I wasn't aware. And so... Um, yeah, I think that's kind of the influence of my work, at least so far. Right. I mean, so that's a, a really uh, perfect transition, right? We're talking about the importance of story and marrying that um, with some of the impact and the real issues that we're, we're hoping to speak to and potentially change. Idris, you've been working a lot um, these last couple of years um, in XR and in the interactive space which is a totally different medium, say from like this, this 2D format and, and the some more traditional media forms. Uh, and Michelle and Joe, right, you have now also entered the XR space with your VR, your first VR piece in The Changing Same. I'm wondering if you all can maybe speak to what was it about interactive, what was it about XR and some of the digital opportunities that you saw in telling some of these stories, right? What was different for you and why did it seem right? Well, I think for me, it was, it spurred off of just straight up interest. Like I was growing up in a time when that was come that was coming to be. I was in college when the first Oculus development kit came out. And so there was a little bit of buzz about that. And like throughout growing up, I was always playing video games. Uh, my dad was always buying the new technologies going on. And so that was very, I was always very tech forward. Mm -hmm. And so, and in, in college, I studied computer science and cognitive science. And even when I was leaving my senior year, my thesis and stuff was focused on the emotional effects of VR and AR and how to, how to create empathy within these technological systems. And so um, it offered me a space to really explore something cutting edge and something new. And with what I was studying, even then, it was like I had two paths in, at the end of college. Like I could go work as a software engineer and build tools, internal tools for Google or something, or these corporations, these white corporations that already exist. But I wanted to tell a story. I wanted to make a change. And I wanted to do that with the media, with the way that I was working, which was technology. And so it that choice to go either, either go the software engineering route or go the creative route was a big one and it it's a way it's a new way to tell stories and it's an accessible way to tell stories and i think what drew me specifically to augmented reality because that's the medium i think i end i ended up trying to working in most um is the fact that it's not taking you out of the real world it's kind of blending the digital world and the real world i think VR has a tendency to cut people off from what is reality. And I think there's something grounding about having the reality present 
And mm -hmm. so whether I can tell stories and everyone has a device and all you have to do is download an app to use this and hear interact with these stories more interactively than ever, that's very interesting to me. And I wanna get those stories out because accessibility is key. But even when thinking about traveling the interstitium with Octavia Butler, that's still a web VR piece. So it is VR, but it's not headset VR. So you are looking at a screen, you are in 360, but you're still attached to the real world. And so there's something grounding about that, that I don't really wanna to get too caught up in the fantasies of escapism. I wanna more blend that escapism with the realities of today. So that's kind of what um, is expiring me, but yeah, long-winded, but that's my answer. <laughs> I love that this I is open. I lay down the gauntlet here, escape this. <laughs> There's a really hard counterpoint that I'm expecting from Michelle and Joe right now. <laughs> but, but first of all, I, I like to dial back a little bit. Because... I wasn't looking to be com confront confrontational. I'm just, I think y'all are doing that as well with your piece. And so I, I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to say anything about but that. I, I want to dial back to something else. It's about creativity and ingenuity. And so, in fact, uh, I, I am not sure that we're looking at the right things when we talk about uh, our contribution to his level of creativity. In fact, mm -hmm. we did many things to, to thwart his creativity. <laughs> like we did everything to keep him off of these games, right? <laughs> and, uh, because what we wanted him to be is organized and we wanted him to be full of knowledge and uh, we wanted him to feel good about himself. But creativity, as I understand it now, really is about giving someone the, the space to play uh, on, a, uh, on games that are not adult-centered. And that was the video games. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, and so that's kind of a contradiction. Uh, but, uh, but the other issue for us is uh, creativity comes with uh, the ability to fail over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so if it's one gift that I think I gave you, Idris, <laughs> and that is you F up, you get up and you F up again. And we still respect that. And so the, the thing is that that is what I got when I came to New York and fell into a, a, a nest of collaborators mm -hmm. who read my first script and said, this is the worst shit I've ever read. And then they invited me over that to a house for drinks and we worked on it. We rewrote that script 80 times. And so, uh, and what I am saying is that, that, uh, that, that is a concept that we, we, um, we use mm -hmm. in parenting, but it's also, we use in our work and with our, with our, our friend, we, we're trying to be more accepting you may not have seen that in American it, <laughs> dramas. <laughs> we needed the drama, but but the reality is that's that's what we do, and that's partially what brought us um, to XR. Uh, so there were many reasons we came to uh, XR. They were complicated, <clears throat> right? Uh, we got a small grant uh, from uh, the Sundance Institute and School uh, to examine with a in a partnership with the EJI, the Equal uh, Justice Initiative, uh, the concept of slavery uh, never ending, the Civil War never ending, just evolving. And, and for us, that was a very personal story. And, uh, and so we decided to develop a trilogy uh, of short films but they gave us a little extra money. Uh, they gave us uh, enough money to do a brain trust, a two day brain trust with, I don't know, 20 people this, uh, looking at different ways of telling this story. In addition to the short films, which is how we landed on working and collaborating with Scatter on uh, this uh, trilogy, uh, three episode uh, piece called The Changing Same and American Pilgrimage. Um, we like to call it, um, it's the magical realist time travel through racial terror in America. I want to go back to the escapism <laughs> point that Idris is making, because it's interesting. I think the idea, the reason why we were attracted to VR may be the issue of escapism, but from its flip end, from the side that 
you can take these magical leaps, these imaginary kind of like situations and collide them in VR and make people be in another world where maybe it's easier to acknowledge and confront and come to terms with uh, certain aspects of our common history of our own personal traumas. And that's why it was attractive to us that we could build a world. We could build a world where uh, past, present and future are collapsed. They're not, they're not separate. And, me, and giving us that idea again of slavery only evolving, what does that mean, you know? uh in this in this magical realist space so that's what attracted us uh to vr and specifically to depth get the the volumetric filmmaking where we could actually 3d capture people um and then place them in these worlds as opposed to the 360 video which i find kind of limiting uh in vr well we we uh and we're not Maybe sure we can show it. the trailer now we'll show okay trailer. we'll show the trailer yes we can <laughs> Yes, we can. One second here. Okay, so this is going to be a trailer for the Changing Same episode one, which uh, did premiere. Premiere or was just showcased at, at Sundance uh, last month? Premier. Title The Dilemma. Stand back and watch for the closing doors. <laughs> oh, I can see you're curious. You want to enter? We got a call. This call describes you perfectly. You don't have to come with us. You fit the description. Black, wearing clothing. Shouldn't be surprised by this. Listen. These are some serious charges. A class D felony assault carries a three to seven year sentence in this state. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm a free man. What's it gonna be? Guilty or not guilty? Wow. Okay. So, so many um, riveting images just sparking from that a single uh, trailer. Uh, I want to talk about aesthetic in a bit, uh, but Michelle, you you touched on something else that uh, I think is connecting this piece and and traveling the interstitium, uh, which is this I, idea of history. And I know that history is something that's really important to all three of you as creators and something that you're trying to highlight, both as a reclamation of uh, agency in some ways, and but also as a, a way of reframing some of these paradigms in, in which we talk about um, the past, right? And thinking about the past, present, and future kind of as a subliminal state that we're all always in. Um, I did a little bit of research, and I found this quote that uh, you all featured in in your um, short films for the Changing Same from Octavia Butler. Uh, and the quote is, to survive, know the past, let it touch you, then let the past go. Uh, I'm curious why this quote and why this uh, piece of Octavia's, and if we can use that as a springboard to talk about history in the past and what we're doing here. I just spoke more. OK. Well, the quote comes from our, in our intern. <laughs> And uh, but I was obviously we loved it and it it meant a lot for us and I I think we've summed that up uh, earlier. But what I what I would say is this that uh, that the past is significant on so many levels, right? It's uh, it's uh, from a from a from our own personal story, but an, an American story. Uh, and so, and so when we first came to EJI, they were developing uh, a, a museum that allowed people to deal with um, 
lynching and racial trauma. And so what we had learned is that people have great resistance to that. And, and so, and they've done it in Rwanda, they've done it in South Africa, they've done it in Germany, and most recently in Nantes, France, where, yeah. uh, in France, where the people protested that they were going to take this wharf, uh, which the French didn't understand was one of the major, major shipping uh, uh, ports for slaves worldwide, and, and contributed really to the building of Paris as we know it. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, they resisted. There was a big protest. They ultimately uh, allowed it to go through. They dealt with the history. And that's become a, a, a source of healing uh, for that town and a big source of income because that, that uh, monument is, is quite stunning. Yeah, but it also becomes a, a, a point of pilgrimage, right? To, to, to go and commemorate. And uh, our short film from which this VR is taken is, was, is all about commemorating the past. I think Octavia Butler, when referencing that, is the idea that, for me anyway, the past will eat you up if you don't confront it and you can't move forward. There's no way of moving forward without it because the past is in us. So like it is in our DNA, whether, you know, it's uh, intergenerational, it's epigenetic, you know, and anybody who's lived across this hemisphere has been affected by uh, genocide of indigenous peoples, you know, slavery from as far down in Argentina to as far up north at Hudson Bay, you know, and, uh, and white supremacy. And the question is, whether from a very personal perspective to you know the societal and community so if we don't confront it we can't really let it go right you have to to let something go you have to know it's there right so you have to you have to know it's there otherwise if you bury it it will eat you up and it has been eating us up for generation after generation so so it it it, it is really representative of the work that we do and the work mm -hmm. we want to continue to to do but I, I, I do think we, we, we do it, but we want to do it in a way that's also inviting and in a way that where storytelling comes is at the, the, is at the center of it. Because it's storytelling is also in our DNA, right? Whatever the culture, there's always that, 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 that community of, of understanding the human condition and community through story, you know, and it, it's, it's, it, it's a tool. It's a tool. Idris, uh, I'm wondering if you have a response either to the quote or, or, I mean, of course, the great Octavia Butler is uh, the subject of your piece, right? So you in speaking a bit more about the collaboration that led you featuring her and, and what that process has been like. And it, it occurs to me that I haven't shown your trailer, so I'm happy to jump in there if you want to I mean, speak can, over it. You can put it, yeah, you can put it on and I'll just speak over it because it's okay. just a preview of what the island looks like. Yep. Um, well, I think my piece is really, it's a collection, I guess I call it, of audio spatial memories. And the inspiration for that, or the space, and kind of the, the piece as a whole, is really about the idea of an ancestral memory or an ancestral cloud. And so where I, this idea stemmed from was me thinking about what if this archive, this ancestral archive of Black history was a tangible space um, what does that look like? How do how would the people react within that? And then this space of uh, I guess my piece is called Quantum Summer, and this island is called Planet Inkwell. And so on Planet Inkwell, I was like, what happened? What would happen if Black people were able to form their own refuge um, on this island in the ancestral cloud? And it's I think it came from me really thinking about looking at the canon of black radical history um, from the Gullah Islands in South Carolina to even when you think about it, just me interacting with the archive and with Octavia Butler, one of the things about Octavia Butler that inspired me was really to create this whole world for myself. Um, and within Octavia Butler's piece, I think one of the things that I really connected with most was her ideology around the connection between community, nature, and technology. And when I was looking at the medium that I was using for WebBR and the ethos of how Octavia Butler used technology, 
what I gathered was that alone technology really doesn't provide this means for protection and survival, but it really needs to be used in symbiosis with nature and with history and the archive. And even when you look at, let's say, Parable of the Sower and, uh, and the main character in um, that book, Lauren, um, it's clear that uh, the authentic liberation of her peoples is really only achieved through this symbiotic relationship. And so I wanted to provide a platform where I'm putting forth a vision of a world that has Black, the world is intertwined with Blackness, with community, and with nature. And so that was really the big inspiration for this piece. And the actual content of the piece, aside from the visuals that you see, are kind of, I call them mission logs. And so these mission logs are told by four different Afronauts who are inspired by the history of Maroons um, within, within um, the African diaspora. And it was a space to give these Afronauts a, um, a chance at free, of, like, free expression, stream of consciousness expression. What would happen when they were interacting within this archive? What would come about? And so most of these Ex expressions are rap songs. And so I've done it, I did a few of the music. I did a, a little bit of the music for it along with a bunch of my friends. And the music itself is sampled from black history. It's sampled from musicians um, who were working in this lineage of soul music, of dub music. And I guess to sum this all up, I think, and when you look at black radical technology, hip hop, is one of those black radicals and black radical technologies. MCs are the griots that my dad is talking about. And so I wanted to give these modern day MCs who are having these stream of consciousness raps the ability to really actually, I guess, escapism and go to a certain place and just ramble. And I think a lot of these ramblings are what you hear, but it's all pointed down to their experience through the archive in the past, present and future. Um, and yeah, I think yeah, I lost my train of thought, but that's oh, no, I, I love it. Yeah, very, very um, awesome. The I wonder if we can use these last couple minutes before we move into a Q and A here. Um, speaking a bit more concretely about um, the process of collaboration, um, Michelle and Joe, you both spoke earlier about um, kind of like these initial stages uh, before you um, hooked up with Scatter and really took off. Um, and that way, um, you mentioned uh, Skull, you mentioned some of the opportunities with this brain trust through Sundance too. Um, I think it's important to speak to the, the structures that allow uh, or the structures that encourage uh, and actually support wholeheartedly um, this sort of storytelling and, and particularly these creators, right? Um, so uh, I'm wondering how, how the collaboration has been for you all um, and Idris for you as well, of course, right? Like what, what kind of structures have, have supported you and, and what has the landscape felt like for you in getting this thing out there and to get it in front of the audience that you feel needs to see it? You, that, that's a big question. That's, that's a bigger <laughs> question than you've asked uh, all day. That was gonna take another 40 minutes, but I'm, let me say this quickly. Uh, what we needed is a partnership of someone who respected us mm -hmm. and respected our dreams and allowed us to fail. And we found that. We found that in uh, Yasmin Alayat. And, uh, and uh, for those who don't know her, uh, uh, she did zero days. She did 18 days in Egypt. And, and, uh, and, and we would come to her with crazy thoughts. <laughs> and she would never say no. Mm -hmm. Until we went into production, <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we developed this collaborative process where we basically we were essentially in charge of script, but we basically designed this world, and we had mutual values. So one of the values we talked about in terms of creativity is uh, uh, permission to fail. Uh, one of the things that we uh, we 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 cherish is uh, emotional resonance. And, and the third thing is, is pretty pictures. So you can see the pretty pictures, right? But emotional resonance is hard. And so we spend most of our time talking about building the world and building the physics 
uh, of the of that world because they're not the same. Uh, uh, building themes, uh, uh, subtext, uh, and it took years. Uh, and, and and one of the reasons that we were as successful as we were is because we had no money. That's the fourth thing. You need money, and and so the 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 conundrum is this: we did not want to compromise. Uh, we wanted to make this peace. We wanted to be a healing peace, and we wanted to deal with trauma. And people don't want to fund that. <laughs> and so what we were able to do is uh, take that failure and turn it into a stronger visually and emotionally resonant piece. I just want to say one last thing: emotional resonance in, in VR uh, XR is hard, mm -hmm. and we focused on a few things like uh, eye contact. Uh, close-ups. Um, Pulling the user into the experience. The user is the, a, a, a participant, really, in, 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 in the experience. Not so much in the in interactivity, but that they're being spoken to and uh, something is being required of them. Mm -hmm. Because for us, uh, with any experience, and it doesn't have to be for everyone, just the things that we do, we would like you to laugh and cry. And uh, one of them is not enough. Yeah. Idris, yeah. go ahead and take it, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, first off, I mean, in this medium, collaboration is essential. I don't think you can really do it without collaboration. Um, and I mean, in my piece, like my piece had I had 11 people I worked this, on this piece with and over on the whole traveling on interstitium, there's more than 25 people working on the piece. Um, but I think that key for me here was the trust. I think Guild of Future Architects and Kamal Sinclair, I think they gave me a lot of trust off the bat that this would get done. And there was a lot of trust in the process. And I think they, the end result is what the end result is going to be. And I was given the space to really be free in all of my thoughts. No one was editing what I was doing or like trying to push what I was doing. Um, and that really allowed me to do, put my whole self into the piece. Mm -hmm. And like, I, this is like one of the biggest opportunities I've had to date, especially working with people like Terrence Nance, um, Steph Stephanie Dinkins, Sophia Allison, um, and Ari, Ari Malenciano. And it was really, really, it was, it was a lot for me because I was like, I got to put my best foot forward. But I think a key thing that I took out of that was that I knew from the beginning that the platform that this project was going to be on was going to be big. And so I wanted to bring all of the people from my community onto the piece that could really help it be the most authentic expression of what we're doing in our specific artistic communities. So it started out me uh, collaborating with my two friends, Ajay Ram and Richard Bryan. And we took the sessions that I had with a bunch of the people from the Traveling Art Station Project and really workshopped over three months what this thing could be like even before we went into a production process. And then when we got to that end point and had something we were happy with, that allowed us to really bring a lot of other people onto a train that was already moving with clear directions and moving forward. But I think the key within this process was just the trust that the producers had in me and that the, just the directors had in me and everything. And that really allowed something authentic to come out of it. And so that was a really important part to me. Um, and community is especially important. All right, um, I do wanna leave some time for questions before we wrap it up. Um, and I see some really, really great ones in the chat. Um, I might call on a couple of folks um, just to, to ask their, their question to the panel, if you don't mind. Um, can we start with Sebastian? Feel free to unmute and ask a question if you like, Sebastian. Or if anyone else has other questions, feel free to um, use the raise hand function. I have too many to... Uh to ask, but um, so first I wanna uh, thank you for um, this really um, stimulating conversation in, in the, the power of story and, and, uh, and creativity. And um, the, um, and Michelle, uh, uh, coincidentally, I am actually from Nantes. And so that memorial <laughs> that you and Joe 
actually mention re uh, resonates with me um, in in because there is a whole obviously the, the history is very complex and 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 has a lot of facets to unpack uh, beyond just the memorial you know the rings of memory and all of the, the you know the the the, uh, the role that some of the public officials have started to play in in uh, forcing France to do uh, its due diligence in in the 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 the, 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 the the work of memory, I suppose, and, and uh, um, but I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this. But what what I would like to to ask, perhaps, is is um, um, around this uh, the, the the power of stories and and this idea of of maybe um, fostering a true integration of of communities um, and some of the things that that um, and and that you said and some of the um, even uh, my, my first comment on the chat when when I first logged on was was and I saw Idris's face I was like man this man this young man has not changed since since the American promise I mean I, I immediately knew who I was dealing with it was just uncanny and I, I I cannot help but think that that the you know your own trajectory Idris and maybe you as as parents in, in having him, you know, like go to Dalton and, and uh, being in this really, in this environment that already bridges um, uh, different cultural systems and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I feel like we're lacking uh, people who can actually do this because what I find is that um, oftentimes uh, people who come, especially from the African-American community and who, who, have, who have this, um, um, this this great uh, culture um, tend to master a multiplicity of cultural heritages, and they in fact know um, the the they have a, a better awareness and, and and historical understanding of where certain symbols come from, their historical trajectory, how they get situated and localized in in local ecosystems, and so on and so forth. And it allows you this creative power to tell stories in a manner that perhaps people who spend their time just solely in the dominant culture spheres don't have or don't want to have or refuse to have because of course it challenges the established hierarchies that, that, that we have. And, and so I, I just wanted to know if you could speak to this a little bit and, and sort of fostering this integration between different communities and being able to bring people um, at, at the at the table and what Nkomo was saying in terms of, I don't know if I pronounced your name right, Nkomo, I'm really sorry, but uh, in, 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 in fostering this sort of common understanding of history that is not putting one community above the others. It's a big question, Sebastian. It is a huge question. <laughs> On that note, I'm gonna let you debate and go, no. <laughs> First of all, I, I wanna thank you for that question. <laughs> And and uh, and I want to say that that I, that there's been an evolution in, in understanding that question. In fact, I think the younger generation uh, cares less about that integration, and uh, and and so do I. Now, let, and let me tell you why. Because until I'm a man and I'm seen as a man and have my stories told, you don't know me. You're just making assumptions. And so what the reality is this, by me focusing on creating these stories that are amazing stories, that are, that are specific to me, uh, I get the other attention and I get the integration and I get the respect, and the self-respect. And, and so we're doing a little piece for another trilogy <laughs> for WGBH. And we went back and asked these kids that we, we spoke to uh, uh, five years ago after- Ferguson, after the after Ferguson. Ferguson. Uh, and uh, they were 12, 15, up to 22. And we went back, 10 five kids- Five years later, after this uprising, 2020. And say, you know, what's the solution? And, and their solution is, I'm gonna be me. And that, and that you have to learn how to be you. Mm -hmm. And so, and so you say, okay, well, that's walking away. It, it really isn't. It, it really is. I'm going to find my history. 
I'm going to discover, not to prove to you that I'm okay, is that that uh, I'm responsible for the Louisiana Purchase <laughs> and the and the founding of Los Angeles and uh, and the and the, the 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 buildings of of uh, of London uh, and, and great civilizations uh, and along the way the other community, the dominant community, uh, finds their truth. What I, what I do know is that 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 truth and, and my truth are going to intersect. Yeah. And so, but it, I can't be half a partner. I can't listen to stories uh, with your gaze and you have no stories with my gaze. Uh, are, you, are you in the same? Uh, yeah, 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 no, I agree, I agree. That makes a lot of sense. I, I, I want to say something. Yeah. Because I totally agree with that. And I mean, while the arts were like, while our stories need to be told more and they're not really available, I think every day we're being confronted with stories of that are kind of whitewashing our past. Like even if you walk around our cities and look at our monuments, they're celebrating a past of white slave owners and colonialism and genocide, but they're not there's no nuance in these conversations. There's no other side of the stories being told um, or contextualization for why these monuments are even here and exist. And so a segue into my, another project that I'm working on, but I think it's the, my solution and the solution of actually the nonprofit that uh, I founded along with two friends of mine, Glenn, Glenn Kantov and Micah Milner. Um, our solution is the accessibility of these stories. And back to what I, the previous point that I said is like we were creating a space in the digital realm on an accessible device like your phone to be able to not only have these histories available to you, because they are still available to you on the web, but centralized in a location and interactable. Like you can place these stories in a augmented reality in your home. You can use, place them at, if you can be at a public monument and place these statues there to contextualize immediately and put the power kind of in the hands of the people to really use this platform and foundation to interact with these histories, but tell their own stories through these AR mediums. And so um, the app is called Kinfolk, um, Kinfolk AR and iOS, and you can actually download it right now. I would suggest go downloading it, but it's our, um, it's our initial launch into figuring out a way to centralize these locations in a very, interactable and inter I mean, interactive way. Um, and the app is kind of more focused towards students and the classrooms because also while the public spaces are not representative, our classrooms and our textbooks suck. They're not representative of that either. And so we feel like the most impact that I can make would be making these stories available on a platform that could be used as a technology within these classrooms. So if a teacher wants to, is tired of her curriculum and wants to imbue some new stories, it's very easy to download this app and start having the kids interact with stories about Pauli Murray, who people don't even know was an LGBTQ icon from the 20th century who pushed forward a lot of legislation. Um, they don't know the stories about Bayard Rustin, who was actually the figurehead behind MLK. And there needs to be new ways to be able to make this, these educations accessible because a certain part of the population will never want to interact with this, but that's not who I'm trying to speak to. The people there are building this for our communities, but outside of our communities, there's people whose minds can be shifted with the right information that properly contextualizes how we got to this certain point. Yes, and I just, to, just to kind of, I think to your question, we only, it's by focusing on our own personal desires and passions and trauma from which the story comes or the search comes that I think what you're talking about integration later comes. For example, I mean, Idris or the work that we do comes from a, a personal desire and need that we feel needs to come out. But because of the medium that we're using, it's bound to resonate beyond our, 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 our own, um, but our own sort of spheres, but it has to come from our own personal visions, not a desire to tell someone else's story necessarily, or, or this false idea of objectivity or, or however, 
but the, but must come from our own self-awareness of where we're coming from, what baggage we're bringing, and what story are we telling that in some ways is healing ourselves first, right? Healing ourselves first that then leads to the, this, uh, this other ripple effect. Thank you. Thanks for that, Sebastian. Uh, as we come to the top of the hour, I, I do want to take another question if y'all will indulge me. Um, and Como's had her hand up for just uh, for a while now. Uh, I'd love to open it up for you. Hey, y'all. Um, thank you so much for this awesome for this awesome um, talk. I'm enjoying it a lot. Um, I have been. I'm a teacher, and I've been trying to educate myself so much about how to navigate deep conversations with my kids, with my colleagues, with everybody else, with my cat. Um, it's been hard, um, primarily because I'm finding, like as I go to more and more, um, more and more workshops and stuff, like I'm growing a lot, but you know, everybody isn't coming with me. So I end up going through the same experience and sort of getting really frustrated with folks like, why aren't you with me? Why aren't you with me? Why aren't you here? And so I'm wondering, like, as creators, like navigating the space and thinking about this awesome stuff, like, what are you doing to, like, take care of yourselves um, as you're going through this deep and important work? Like, I'm sure you're, you're artists and you, you've got to pitch this sometimes to people who don't get it. And so what are you doing? Like, yeah, just so you don't lose your minds as you're doing this. So let me take this. I'm not, I'm not going to take it, but let me just say this. We're very proud of our son, right? <laughs> and he doesn't have to pitch as hard as we do because of ageism. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, he's got a Netflix thing happening. Okay. Uh, can, can I say that? Is that public? It's about to be public on Saturday. <laughs> that's cool. that's, oh, that's fine. That's uh, <laughs> an, un, an unnamed project a Verizon thing uh, uh, happened so it, it that that's nice uh, but but I uh, getting back to the question I wanted to say that oh, oh my Joe. <laughs> I, I can answer the question <laughs> Go ahead, um, I mean I just delineate my own space from the, I, I have my, I have to have to create my own space. Like I do this work, I do the XR work um, is the main driver of the social impact. And the biggest way that I feel like I can make a difference with my art work, but then I have to create space for me to make music. I have to create space for me to be able to paint and make art. And so that's another part that I really, really cherish. And I don't try to protect that a lot. And so that's like my safe space where all of, even all of the frustrations that I have with working in this XR space specifically for social impact, um, they come out there as well, but it's a place for me to express that stuff. And so that is also a key ingredient for me staying sane throughout this, all, throughout this whole thing. So that's my quick and short answer. I wanna say one thing about that, what, what you're talking about and how you kind of like, um, I think for me, what's key is community a okay. like-minded community it's so key and I can give you an example because you can also get derailed and think oh this project is not worth it people aren't listening but mm. I'll go back to was it three years ago this this VR project took five years to be in the making and I remember we went we were Sundance New Frontier um, fellows <clears throat> and we went to Sundance and they prepped you know pitch sessions for us and we were sitting with Yasmin. Yasmin was pitching from her commercial space and we were trying to pitch in our spaces that, that we knew we were pitching as well. And then we came together, I remember at the lounge and Yasmina says, we've got to change the title. We've got to change this. It's not commercial enough. We're not gonna, and I said, hold on. <laughs> we had an argument in the middle of the lounge. I said, I'm not in here for the commercial. If I were in here in a commercial, I'd be doing something different. We have to believe in this piece, in this piece and the vision that we have with people who will nourish it around and will surround it, a community that will surround it and support it because they believe in that vision. And that's what brought us there. But yes, uh, sometimes our own partners, we have, to, we have to be in sort of discussion with. But the only reason why I felt comfortable enough to tell her, this is not 
the, where the compromise has to happen. So we can be commercial and get that commercial, the Oculus, you know, when they kind of turn their back on us in terms of funding, right? This is not, th that's not where we need to compromise. And I think it's because I understand one, the answers, but I, the ancestors behind me who've sort of like created this space, but I had a community of people who, who I knew, you know, we're going to say, you are right. And we're going to find the money, whichever way we can to make it happen, key people. And those key people are the people who have kind of brought us to where we are now. So going back to when you are confronting that frustration and you think about changing, you know, lanes, you know, I, I call up my friend, Opeyemi, I say, Opeyemi, <laughs> you know, uh, and we kind of vent it out and then understand, okay, we're doing, this is the right, this is the right thing that we're supposed to be doing. And so I, I, I know I'm just piling on. So yeah. we eat a lot of vegetables. Uh, we <laughs> cut down the meat. We, uh, we walk almost every day. Uh, now the pandemic has been a little, a little shaky, uh, but we really, we really have developed uh, uh, friendships. Um, and, and, uh, and right now we're under stress because everything is decaying and our friendships are on Zoom. And uh, we've gone from five days a week working out to one and a half. <laughs> and uh, a pork chop enters our meal <laughs> <laughs> almost <laughs> twice a week. But, but we, we look forward to getting back on, on track. But, but, but I, I would like to just uh, ditto what people are saying. We, we have great friends and uh, we make it, it's an intentional part of our existence. Uh, people who trust us, people who give us uh, good counsel, not sometimes what we want to hear. <laughs> uh, and so I think that's the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I got to echo that as well. I mean, community, I, you, I always have three, two or three voices that I'll go back to and call when something is feeling a little iffy. And people will try to change your vision. People will try to shape what you're doing into something that what they see. And the one thing that this process has done for me is it's made me more confident in my own vision. Um, having to like tell people yet no yes and really stick to what we initially set out to do so community and consultation is what has been able to get me to where i am is being able to rely on people to lead me in the right direction amazing um y'all have been so incredible thank you so much for joining us today we're gonna end on one uh quick some quick tidbits if we can uh, about the projects themselves and how folks might be able to follow you and your work. Idris, let's start with you. Um, where can folks learn more about what you're up to and, and learn more about uh, Traveling the Interstitium? Yeah, so you can travel the Interstitium. It premiered at Sundance and we are gearing up for a formal wide release in the month of March. So you can stay in, stay in tune for that. The link is not live yet, but it will be. Um, and it will be available on all browsers and everything on that, of that nature. But if you want to follow the work, I would, I'm young. So Instagram, that's, that's where you'll find me or Twitter, mostly Instagram. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't, I, I would have to shamelessly plug again, my app Kinfolk, because it is speaking exactly to what we're, we're, we're talking about here. And it's something I've been working on for three, four years now. And it's really, this launch is a call to action really for people to help get us involved and build out this archive because community is, we don't want to build this technology and foundation in silo, like a lot of people are doing. We want to involve the communities, especially when we're speaking about them. So I would download the Kinfolk app on iOS or Android and reach out if you want to help out build this thing to something that's much bigger. But yeah, those are the two projects that I feel like relate the most. And um, yeah, you follow me on Instagram, you'll figure out when um, they drop. Awesome. Thank you. And I think we actually, somebody um, linked the app in chat as well for anybody. Yeah, both of, the, both of the links are in the chat, the Android and the iOS. Mm -hmm. awesome. Michelle and Joe? Uh, yeah, we, uh, well, the uh, Changing Same episode one is coming to a festival near you, which is still, um, um, we, it, it will definitely come to a festival near you. I just can't reveal just yet, but we're excited about that and we'll be making some 
changes to that first episode of the changing same that will be so it'll be a new and improved uh, experience and we'll be going into the design and production phase for uh, episode two and three you know through to the end of the year our plan is to finish the episode at the end of this year and to see you know the body of our work uh, on our website you can connect at radastudio.org and we have a newsletter that you can sign up for and we are also on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, both individually and uh, Rada Studio. Awesome. And that Twitter looks pretty good, Idris. <laughs> looks better than mine. I got kicked off of Twitter, so I lost like all my followers. <laughs> I tried to deactivate, and you can't deactivate your Twitter for more than 30 days or else they delete it. So I was punished for trying to take a break. Oh, wow. <laughs> Once again, I, I really, really appreciate uh, everybody joining. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. It's been an awesome conversation for me, and I hope it was equally valuable for you all listening. Uh, we're going to do more of these conversations, so stay tuned to Talk and Play. Um, if you're not a part of the Games for Change newsletter, please jump on that. That's where we make a lot of these first announcements. Um, and we're recording this, so we'll, we'll be uploading it on our YouTube as well. So uh, once again, thank you, everybody, for joining. We, we hope you had a good time. I certainly made it five stars in the app store. When yeah, right. Five stars, right. Subscribe. Five stars. Hit the bell. <laughs> get notified. Yeah. Subscribe you. to the newsletter. Yeah. Let's go. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.